one, and you're live. Hello, um, everyone, and uh, welcome back to the Siegel Talks here from the Martin E. Siegel Theater Center <clears throat> at the Graduate Center CUNY in the City University of New York from New York. And this is week two of our um, Siegel uh, Talks. We um, ask uh, uh, our friends, our artists and collaborators, people we look up to, to, to join in and let us know uh, how they create meaning out of the, this time of Corona we live in. We feel it's important to have a space to think and to uh, also um, reflect on uh, what theater now is all about. Uh, everything that makes theater theater is gone. We don't have space, we don't have money, we can't get together. So it's one of the hardest hits uh, uh, communities in the sense when it comes to work. And, um, and it's also a time um, in a way for, for uh, reflection. We had fantastic uh, uh, collaborators speaking um, already uh, to us. Um, the very beginning it was Taylor Mack and Kristen Martin from the HERE Arts Center, Taylor's great project tricklepnyc.org, uh, where he created a platform within a week or 10 days. It's unbelievable. Well, over 50 New York artists created content that could be looked at. All you have to do, give $10 a month, a little bit like a Netflix uh, idea, and the money really 100% goes to the artists. And this is interesting, important work from New York writers, directors, and playwrights, and thinkers, and performance artists. It's uh, great. Uh, we went on then to talk with people from uh, China and uh, uh, Hong Kong who told us about the situation where it was a little bit uh, easing in China, you know, uh, Han Shen said, you know, he never thought that uh, cyber space is real, but now it is real. It's a, that what connects him to the outside world. And uh, and uh, Mark uh, Chiu Yua uh, talked about uh, Shang, about um, Hong Kong and the um, fight that is also still waiting. He says, you think Corona crisis, you get over and then everything goes on. Um, but uh, for us, other things are waiting. And I guess perhaps also this is in the, um, in the Middle East uh, a bit, uh, the, the uh, reason. Uh, Thomas Ostermeyer from Berlin uh, joined us in and he reminded us you know, to stay sober, as he said. He said uh, um, not to look into any meaning that an Old Testament God is striking back to mankind and uh, that we are punished for something. He said it's chaotic. There is no sense to all of this. And we have to uh, prepare, take the time, he told artists, Take the time to prepare. Theaters will open, so be better prepared and do something. He teaches also at the um, Ernst Bosch at the university. We um, had uh, then Armana Montanari and Marco Martinelli from the Adriana Alba in Italy who gave us an update uh, for, I think, four or five weeks now. They stay at home, don't leave their house. They can only go three minutes out to their marketplace, buy things, go back. Both of them said they live like monks and they get up at 12 noon, eat, uh, work eight hours a day, write, read, do serious work, and uh, eat again, and then watch films uh, for three, four hours till two or three in the night. And, and then Toshiki Okada, the great uh, Japanese uh, thinker, director, writer, um, who uh, was so deeply already affected by the Fukushima disaster, told about his life. He had already moved his family out of Tokyo because he thought disasters will not end, they will come again. His work has been stopped also. He worked a lot in Germany at the Munich Kammerspiele. He's actually working right now on a play of a, a young uh, designer who created an Olympic stadium for the Tokyo Olympics and she died. Uh, the design was rejected and she comes back as a ghost and uh, uh, talks to, uh, to everyone. And he says he's disappointed in his government. He does not feel anything will happen, but he also says it's a time of reflection for him. It's a time to think, to write. And it's like a field where you uh, need uh, to let it rest or to air it. And, um, but nobody of us has chosen this, but a theater artist always has adapted uh, to things like this. Right now we have three extraordinary artists uh, from, uh, from the Middle East, from Egypt and from uh, Leb Lebanon. We have Laila Soliman, who's here from Egypt, a great playwright. She was at the Siegel Center, a director, highly respected internationally. Also Sahar Amasaf, who's uh, from Lebanon, from Beirut, where she does extraordinary um, theater work uh, at the American University in Beirut, but also uh, in the town uh, herself. She did a great documentary plays on Syrian women who were abused and forced into prostitution. It was all for one or two years going on in the center of uh, Beirut and nobody did anything. And she did a very 
courageous production and little work has about the wedding and challenges around uh, the speaker, the site-specific work. And then we have also Dalia Bassoni, who is a, a great uh, thinker of theater and academic, but also a playwright, a director, and a community activist who has followed the Egyptian scene over a long, long time, a journalist also. So we have all of them here with us to get um, a in little view of what's happening there. So please do excuse me, my... Uh, my long uh, opening monologue, but each day it gets longer because we have more uh, more, more uh, people coming. Just uh, to acknowledge it, while we're talking, people are on the respirators in hospitals all around the world, especially also in New York City. People are dying as we speak with the virus, perhaps not just because of it, but with it. And so how is the mood? How What, do our, what are people thinking? And uh, and maybe we start with Dahlia, since your face is on the screen right now. What's going on in Cairo? Um, well, tell us a bit about the mood on the street. Um, I haven't talked in a while, so forgive me when I find my words. <laughs> I live alone uh, in a farm outside of Cairo, so uh, I only use my dog voice most of the time. I live with a few dogs. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. and the situation in Egypt has um, different facets, and Laila can add to this uh, uh, in her turn, um, there is a, a curfew part of the day, um, starting 7 p.m. So movement is not allowed, and from 7 p.m. till 6 in the morning, um, and there's the police enforcing that and restricting movement. Meanwhile, some uh, companies are forcing their workers to go to work, and uh, the construction business is pushing for the workers to be at work, uh, building. Uh, um, new luxury condominiums and uh, uh, out in the desert so it's a very um, very fascinating <laughs> uh, tension somehow uh, being asked to stay at home and uh, self-isolate while many people can't afford to not go to work because they're they earn their living on a daily basis so if they don't go to work they starve so you're caught between a rock and a hard place and a I, I die if I don't go to work, I die if I go to work. So this, this tension is really active in, the, in big um, parts of the society, while uh, some people have the luxury of to self-isolate or work from home. And um, in many situations, people have been fired from their work because their companies are not um, acting responsibly against them. So it's a really difficult, challenging, intense time. And um, artists, of course, are hit, but uh, society at large is, is dealing with something that they have not dealt with um, to this extent before. Mm -hmm. um, Laila, maybe you tell us a little bit more, because I guess you are more perhaps in the center of Cairo. Um, a, a friend of mine told me that for the first time in a thousand years, mosques have been closed. Um, yeah. So uh, tell us a bit, uh, Laila, um, what, is, what, is, what is the mood on the street? Uh, what do people um, think about? So during the day, everybody can walk out and just in the evening they go back, is that true? During the day, everybody can go out. The government advises anybody who can stay at home to stay at home. But I think the tension has to do also with the political state of when do people listen and when don't they listen, especially if they're used to the person giving them orders, not always having uh, transparent policies for their best. So mm -hmm. it's very confusing, especially when curfew came, there were a lot of different political opinions about the enforcing of a curfew and what that means in um, public opinion. Uh, and also, does it I think we do just well lost, or not? Yeah, could you say again? I think we just lost you for a moment. Um, whether enforcing a curfew mm -hmm. uh, will be sort of another seized opportunity by an autocratic state to enforce mm -hmm. a lot of things um, or not and also whether the people will listen to it just because it's a curfew or will they understand the measures that are needed uh, to somehow pass that uh, situation of slowing the curve the other issue is also i think with in con like in a place like Egypt, where there are general hygienic questions, uh, and also, um, especially with difficulties of infrastructure, you know, like still in places in the countryside, there's a difficulty with 
water um, and, and certain means. Um, so it, it, it's also quite complex with the literacy rate, with how uh, uh, in general mass media is dealing with the situation to kind of grasp what reactions it will have, because the government was quite late in reinforcing certain measures, it was giving very mixed messages through mm -hmm. mass media mm -hmm. on the somehow, on the one level scaring people and uh, uh, of the fact that there is a pandemic and so on. Uh, but on the other hand, you see their meetings where they are quite close together or uh, only um, two weeks ago, I think they stopped the collective prayers, but until then, you know, uh, weekly masses or the, the collective prayer on Friday was aired on public TV. So how can you, on the one hand, scare, of, scare people of Corona and give them uh, instructions on what to do and what not to do and advise them before the curfew to stay home uh, but on the other hand then continue with all of these uh, government meetings and uh, governmental decisions to continue airing collective prayers and so on so I think the messages were quite mixed uh, as well as enforcing then at the end Kind of the power of the state and then also the uh, the people on the street on the one hand are very nervous on the one hand on the other hand but are also kind of ignoring or taking it kind of lightly uh, mm -hmm. the virus so it, i think it's quite confused yeah it is especially saying all day you can go just in the night but most people are at home anyway it doesn't sound like a um um, a real uh, um, um, uh, instruction for the public to 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 keep them safe and to uh, keep uh, them away from 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 harm. Um, so, how is the situation um, on the streets of Beirut, which are normally so bustling? Uh, you, it's hard to even cross the street with all the motorbikes and the cars and the people and the bars yeah. and uh, all of it. Beirut, which is a great uh, a town in the Middle East, uh, a very open one also. So um, how does it look now? Yeah, hi, Frank. Hi, everyone. Um, I think it's the situation here is, I guess, like everywhere else. We've been on lockdown since early March. I remember my last rehearsal session was scheduled for March 9 and never took place. Although the week before, I was also quarantining at home and holding rehearsals at home. Um, for the past few days, you know, um, Although the numbers are, you know, the numbers are dropping, the numbers of infected casing, cases are actually dropping, but the, everything is still shut down. The airport is shut, schools, universities, theaters, everything basically, except for pharmacies and food stores. Um, the authorities or, or also, also imposed a curfew. All day uh, or know. just night Well, also. see, this is the same situation. Did it make sense to me at first? It was from 5 p.m to 7 a.m. the next morning. And then just yesterday, they announced a new measure. And that is, uh, if you have an even number uh, with your car plate, you can, you know, you can commute on certain days. And if you have an odd number, you know, your car plate ending in an odd number, you commute on other days. Um, so you still see movement on the streets, but basically everything is shut down. So people are actually commuting probably from one place to another, um, you know, uh, to the food stores, to pharmacies, uh, to hospitals. Um, few people today, the Minister of Interior was saying that around 20% of the Lebanese are not respecting the, the safety measures that the, the authorities are trying to impose, and he's planning to escalate the, these measures and uh, the penalties, basically, if people don't uh, respect, because the situation is, you know, unprecedented we've never like Lebanon per se has witnessed so many difficult situations throughout its short history but this is civil wars right you, yeah you, I mean you grew up in there right it's it's a little funny my father this morning was saying and my father is 85 and has has been has lived through many different wars uh, and he was saying that this is harder than any war that he has lived through it's not something anyone has experienced before so the feeling the mood is quite overwhelming 
it's you know it's um, my friend called this my colleague called this on facebook collective trauma and i wholeheartedly agree i feel it in my you know in my every cell it's uh, it's scary it's sad as you said people are dying you know you, you it, the whole world suddenly feels so connected we're connected in our uh, humanity in we're, we're in the same boat at the same time obviously some people are more privileged than others and it's sad it's just a sad fact that people are uh, in some places people are not being able to fight this um, so it's quite tough here like everywhere what were you rehearsing in March, early March. We, we were practicing for Fefo and Her Friends, a play by Maria Irene Fornes, a feminist text from the 70s, which seemed suitable and appropriate. Right now, nothing is making sense. Nothing seems uh, <laughs> like a good story to tell. Um, but that's what we were planning to perform in April. Actually, the play was scheduled to be performed last November, and we had to postpone due to the Lebanese October 17 revolution. And now again, we're postponing. So I don't know if we're going to end up actually doing this play or not. But for now, um, we stopped the rehearsals, obviously, for safety mm -hmm. of everyone. Thank you. Um, Dalia, what, what do you hear from your artists, friends um, in, in Egypt? I know you are in contact with so many. And how does it affect you personally? Um, there was a festival scheduled to happen in March. It was the first time to have uh, the ISIS the uh, Women Theatre Festival, and um, of course it was cancelled. And the disappointment uh, in the circles of the people who were organizing that festival was um, a pretty intense. It's like they, they, they worked for a couple of years to try to uh, gather artists from all over the world and to have women's stories be told in Egypt. So that was uh, one, of, one of the many things that was uh, postponed indefinitely, or indefinitely for now. Um, the, there is a, there's a lot of frustration, but also what Sahar was saying, the, the, the sense of a collective trauma, we're all in this together. We don't understand what is it and how it's really um, affecting us as individuals, as a community yet, because we're in, in the midst of it, or maybe we're in the beginning of it, hopefully <laughs> we're, uh, see the, the light of the end of the tunnel, but nobody really knows what, what would be the next step or how to prepare, or as Sahar is saying, what kind of stories do we tell now and can can we can we do something theatrical when we're not in the same physical space together some artists are creating uh, online things uh, they aired a theater festival they call it the international theater festival in egypt where people can watch plays online but i don't think it would um, it deserves the, the, the title or the name because it's very different kind of format. It's uh, watching a play on your screen, maybe on your phone or whatever. So the frustration is high and some people are still planning for things to happen hopefully in the summer or in the fall, but nobody really knows. So this uh, sense of uh, complete lack of control is uh, um, paralyzing a lot of people, posing a lot of uh, questions and at the moment, no answers. So tell us a little bit, uh, not, you are someone who normally is, enjoys going out, uh, being in contact with everybody. Are you alone on your small farm or property? How, do, how does your day look like when you get up? What do you do? And, and do you do artistic work or what's going on? Um, I, I created a, a play based on th like three monologues with, by three women um, earlier in the year. And I was in rehearsals and I, got, I postponed it for other reasons. And um, I was thinking the last few days, maybe we can rehearse from, from our home since we can yeah. communicate via Zoom. I don't know what does that mean for a performance later on, but uh, I've been in touch with the actresses and they were saying, yes, please save us from the TikTok world because this is where they are sending their creative energy for now. Um, I have great plans to finish texts and uh, start other texts, but unfortunately I'm not capable of doing that part yet and i'm spending a lot of my energy to grow gardening and uh putting a lot of seeds in the ground the, the the weather just warmed enough to for me to do that so uh um at least we will have food at the at the other end of it <laughs> but um, yeah. I, um, I i want to create more and i want to do some more writing and then i look at my computer every day but i'm not able to cross that barrier yet but gardening mm -hmm. 
I, I can push myself to do that. Yeah. So um, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm planting seeds for the future. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's also Thomas Ostermeyer who said he felt he's been hit, or, you know, like a football player on a field and you are still numb. You can't really get up. He was used to with numb that it will, it will take a while. Toshiki Okada for his work, uh, he actually does online rehearsal one-on-one. -on -one. And he said, I never wanted to do that. But he said, it's interesting in a way the actor now has the same space as he has. So he feels maybe there's a democratization going on that something will, will, will change, he says, but so to prepare um, for it. So Laila, um, wh what are you doing? Where do you live and uh, how does your day look like? How do you engage? Uh, I'm staying with my partner. So I feel very lucky in such times not to be alone. Uh, mm -hmm because I, I understand that for a lot of people that's part of what's difficult in these times is the complete aloneness, the confinement, the, uh, the lack of freedom to move uh, and to possibly uh, be completely deprived of touch, even mm -hmm. handshakes, uh, which I think is part of what makes this crisis all over the world more difficult um, other of course than the people suffering and dying from it uh, and also depending on the privilege like Sahara and uh, Dalia mentioned um, I think I'm like everybody else busy with doing a lot of housework and cleaning and cooking um, mm. enjoying time my partner and dog I'm still um, doing the work that I was supposed to do physically virtually which is workshopping uh, for the creation of a new opera uh, docufictive based on the novel of Noel, novella Noel, of Noel Sadewi Women at Point Zero combined with documentary material filmed with women who killed their husbands uh, in prison in Egypt um, and although I objected, it was interesting because I had objected in, in, in the planning of this process with the producer uh, against online workshopping. And I mm -hmm. insisted that we all physically meet the filmmaker, the, yeah. the, mm -hmm. the librettist and um, the composer, uh, at least to begin the process collectively, physically in one space. And now, uh, we had to cut that short in Belgium and uh, three of us are in Egypt in different houses and uh, one is still in London. Um, so I think it, it's interesting for me because it forced me to think again about how uh, things will continue since it was something that I refused very consciously and that I still do not favor. Uh, for different reasons, uh, like to completely base creative processes in online virtual existence at a distance. Um, the other thing is that I'm supposed to start rehearsals in May for a very intimate interactive piece, which is a fake living room piece. Um, where there's a, a Sudanese coffee ceremony that is shared. Um, and I really wonder not only if that will happen, because it hasn't been officially canceled, but it's also, again, uh, forcing me to think, how will the next year and a half or two years look like? Does this, will this be realistic and reasonable? Or do we have to rethink? And what do we do as artists who have been um, fighting for a slower pace uh, in life, also resisting uh, virtual and online work completely in relation to our creative practices, um, but also as an independent Egyptian theater maker um, who only works through making theater, it has been a necessity to travel a lot and work in other parts of the world, whether it's uh, to 
gain a living by touring or uh, answer to commissions. So how will that continue in the next, again, according to research, year, year and a half? And even if it's not, even if, I mean, within the current political global structures, even if um, sort of medicine or, or uh, vaccination is found, it's still not going to be equally distributed in all parts of the world, uh, mm -hmm. realistically. So also, which again will bring up, for me, brings up new question of when will uh, freedom of mobility return? Because it will mean new regulations concerning quarantines for all of, especially the global South countries, which are kind of later catching up with Europe uh, and the States in their curves. So by the time these are kind of passing certain waves, the others will be catching up realistically. So what will that mean? Hmm. Then? How, how is your support? Do you, do you get support from government? What, have people co continued their commission? I mean, there was a case, I think, in New York theaters that uh, single knowledge and others said they have been commissioned by a theater and the theater uh, said, we're not going to pay you even though they started work because the play is not happening. Of course, I think mm -hmm. that's outrageous. But how is the situation? How will you survive? What will you do? And uh, how do you make a living now? Or what's, what, what are your plans? Will you get support from somewhere? I'm personally lucky enough to have uh, enough um, uh, savings uh, and also for the one of the partners I've worked with to have offered to pay at least a part of the money uh, based on the work that's been done. Um, but I understand that it might mean that continuation of work might be cancelled and that I might not work for the next year that you um, will not have work in time for the next year will the yes, egyptian government if i don't travel i don't think i'll have work it, it, will there be some help from a government or from the state of egypt do you think i don't think so uh i they, they offered all what's been said now is for uh, people and Dali, correct me if i'm wrong for people who uh earn their daily bread to ask for uh, a support of 300 or 500 pounds. 500 pounds. 500 pounds um, in case they cannot, if, if their livelihood is affected. $500. Mm. So, Dalia, you, sorry, you were smiling when I said, will there be any support? It's What's $25, your... basically. $25. No, yeah, 30, about $30 yeah. to be exact. Yeah. And uh, one time only, not very, regularly. <laughs> so one time payment of thirty dollars. And it's going to be very difficult to get that because it's only a, a hotline, one landline. One number so of people have to call. Yeah, it it seems like a very strange um, process, and also an application for people who have to fill that. Mind you, uh, it's clear we have very high illiteracy rates. <laughs> So it's, it's, it's quite a strange thing that's strange happening. Thing. And in general, for artists, I mean, some people are um, like Dalia teaching or employees of the Ministry of Culture. So I think their salaries go on, but most other artists uh, are not in any way supported by the state. So that sounds like a piece of an absurdist project theater piece that they're a one-time payment of $20 there's only one landline in all over Egypt for people to apply and you have to fill out something uh, before, <clears throat> which I guess have to send it by mail. It doesn't, it's, a, it's, a, it's of course devastating and shocking. Dahlia, what, do you, what is your evaluation? What is going to happen to the artistic scene, the theater scene, women in theater also? You know, I, like, as Laila was saying, uh, most, most of the independent artists have no support at all. We work other jobs maybe to, uh, make ends meet and sometimes we get commissions for projects but uh, there are a few people who are hired by the state so they work for the the government theaters and they have a, a meager salary but it's a regular salary and then they get paid um, 
when they do a project, like they get paid for rehearsals or 15 days of performance or whatever. So all of that money is not happening, even for those who are supported by the government mm -hmm. or are official employees of the government. For the rest of us who are not um, each to, to their own, and um, I'm, and Mike, I'm, I'm not commissioned to do anything now. I was hoping to push one of my plays and then film a basic like rehearsal and then start looking for funding for it. And that's not happening at the moment. And who knows when that would be a, um, a possibility. So it's, um, it, it's, it's pretty hard and people are trying to think of possibilities. How, how do we support each other? Like the, the Tyler Max idea of creating something like a platform and presenting work on it um, is, is maybe a way that could work in, in New York or in the States, but I'm not sure if people would fund or pay for art when basic needs like minimum, min, basic yeah. food and uh, medicine is not uh, fulfilled. So uh, it, it's a much more dire situation than uh, I can fathom of like a solution for. Mm. Yeah, this is, uh, this is uh, for sure extremely hard, especially also artists who in a way perhaps expressed uh, as every artist does uh, problems in a country that do exist we theater also is a way to work through problems it's a greek theater where you show something and you learn something you show a problem or because it's in personal life or in the society and i also do know that of course in egypt and, and I'm not, it's in other countries once you are not um, um, a government artist once you express your own opinion it's also e even more complicated to get such as you said a meager salary a job and um, sahar how is the situation in Lebanon for theater artists? You are part of the theater scene in Lebanon and Beirut, which is a lively scene. And um, in the old days, it was called uh, the, the Paris of the Middle East. And uh, there's all the complications, of course, that are out there. Yeah. So what's what's going on there? What what? How do people survive? Uh, it's it's been day? really a hard year for uh, theater artists here. You know, before the COVID nineteen, we had. You know, starting last October, we had the at the beginning of the you know um, what we're calling now the revolution, the October 17 revolution. Um, you know, all theaters I would say in Lebanon closed down in support you know of the revolution because our uh, feeling that was that we needed to be in, in on the street. We don't want people to come to the theater. We want people to be on the street because that's where change is happening that's where people need to be you know so you as, were on the I, also you you were on the streets protesting. i was on the street you know as much as i could because i have i you know my son is now 14 months old so he was uh, around seven months when the revolution started but i took him i would go when it's safe you know my husband was every day on the street so we we had a represent representative on the street as a family um mm -hmm. but i'm 100 percent pro the revolution and everything it called for um, and you know, in theater, what my feeling usually, and the, the why I do theater, because as you said, it's it's a place where change can happen, or at least, like Augusto Boal used to say, it's a rehearsal for a revolution. So when a revolution is happening, you need to be in the revolution. So theater is closed down um, for that reason, and then bit by bit they reopened again. Uh, we had, as AUB, we had to cancel our show because uh, same reasons. Um, but other independent theaters, I mean, I'm lucky that I work, uh, I have a sub institutional support, but many other artists in this country, they work on their own. And they started reopening their doors so that they could survive. Then COVID-19 happened, you know, uh, arrived in Lebanon and we had to close uh, down again. So the situation is, you know, similar, I would say, to what I'm hearing my colleagues here say. Um, it's, uh, you know, it, it's really hard time for, for artists. And because, uh, again, my feeling, I mean, I, I find it hard to say that because I've never, in my life, I never imagined that I would say theater is not important at the moment. And I'm saying this now in the sense that of course, it's going to help us tell the stories. It's going to help us understand what we're living right now. But right now, there are people who are in need of their basic needs. They need you need they need to be fed. They need to feel safe and secure. Once we can assure that people have this, then we can talk about creating. I mean, and I find I'm really lacking motivation in in this period of time. 
um, I'm trying to take it easy and one day at a time and, you know, ease the feeling of the overwhelming feeling that I'm living, uh, that I'm experiencing, like everyone else. I mean, I'm, I, at the same time, I'm very grateful that I'm safe and I, I can cook and I can, you know, I have a house and I, you know, the basic stuff again. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I don't know. Do you think uh, this will change your work? Will you be a different artist when you come out, when we all will come out of the COVID-19 tunnel? Or? I think so, like everything else. I mean, right now, for instance, I'm, um, I'm, I'm in the village where I come from. I haven't lived here for the last 24 years. My first 16 years of life were here, but then I moved out. And now in I came back. In the mountains? I, in there? the mountains. It's called the Shuf What's the name? It's mm -hmm. the Shuf Mountain. And your village uh, name is? My village name is Warhaniye. Um, so I'm staying with my father who lives alone and, um, you know, to take care of him, but also to enjoy his company. I haven't lived with him for so long. Um, and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm still teaching online and I'm still caring for my son and my father and my family. Um, at the same time, I'm rediscovering certain aspects about my own life that I haven't been in touch with for so long. I've been recording sounds of the village that I think I miss. Now I'm realizing that I miss, but I have never really thought about this. And I think these will find their way to my work in the future. I'm sure we, we all, at least here, will need, we, we, we will need theater to tell these stories. How are we going to do this and how it's going to change the form and the style? I think this is up to time to tell. I can't answer that question now. I think it's too much already to think about what stories we want to tell. There's so much going on. And at the moment, I think it's important to experience and to be present as much as possible because even that is kind of hard because as you know, as all these artists that you, you met, Frank, it's, 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 it doesn't make any sense, you know? So I'm trying to be as present as possible. I'm, you know, connecting to my to my roots as much as I can. I'm trying to breathe as much as possible and, you know, just stay sane for the moment. And reflection will happen later on. We need the distance to be able to reflect and to make sense of things. Mm, thank you. Laila, same question to you. Do you feel something is happening inside you? Is there something changing? I think the world will definitely change. And I, uh, I mean, of course, we can never know, but my feeling is there are two uh, opposite changes that are happening at the same time. One is uh, very much in tune with uh, capitalist needs and the, I mean, the idea that to force people to continue work online exactly the same way they would have done in other places, I find very complex. Uh, and I feel for everybody who is obliged to go to work with that worry or to continue to work in the same way as if nothing is changing, but to even work even more and obliged to produce even more. Um, and in the other in the other direction, there will be people who will recognize this time as a time to question a lot of the status quo that has been before this period, uh, to think of time in a different manner, to think of also, I mean, people who have been calling out for producing of food, like what Dalia was mentioning about growing their own food and uh, all of these kind of uh, suggestions um, to fight capitalism have been called a bit crazy or, uh, um you know so so i think that might change uh, more people will question their previous lifestyles uh before this period uh and the same definitely goes for me i think i'm working at a low capacity being very gentle on myself and on my team um keeping ourselves sane with creating doing some creative work which we can do remotely but at the same time um, like Sahar was saying trying to really be in the moment enjoy all the um, 
labor I have to do uh, and give time for uh, emotional and uh, intellectual digestion as well of what is happening. Mm. And I'm, I'm very worried about the future because for me, theater has been to a great degree uh, about intimacy. Um, and uh, I've been very much always uh, trying out formats that put this in question. And I have a feeling that this will more and more be not possible. And we're having a little static. Um, I'm here, but um, yeah, thank you. That's uh, that's uh, that's uh, these are airplanes above my head, airplanes, <laughs> Not static. Mil yeah, military mil planes, military. Yes, they're the only ones who can uh, be in the sky can now. Fly. Sorry, <laughs> yeah, well, no, that's uh, all part of, uh, of the reality we 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 do we do live in. Um, I go. I know all of you, all three of you. You know, wrestling with the um, um, situation of society in the country. You do your theater work. Will you feel work will get more political? Will you? Oh, I know everything you do, whether it's openly political or is a political work. But will you think it will be more political? Will people want to see plays that uh, deal with the situation, or will it be more escapatist? Will people say we want to see a comedy? We want to see something different. Um, from theater when it comes to it. What, what are your predictions? What will happen in uh, Egypt and Lebanon? I'll, I will refer to something that happened during the years of the unfolding of the Egyptian revolution where um, when the revolution became in vogue and many people who were working for the government theaters were doing revolutionary plays. Uh, or this is what they called them, but the content was really um, um, the counter-revolution. It's just mm -hmm. how it was labeled or how it was presented to, uh, to ride on that wave. So uh, from, from that, I'm not very optimistic that the work that will get support from the government or the major theaters or media coverage would be really political in the way I would understand or want to see political theater because that, that work is um, unsettling and uh, there is very, very small margin for it that Lila created work during like that margin when it was open and then now that margin is, is not there at all. I have not seen any work by Lila in Egypt in many years because um, it's become it's much 2016. harder. 2016. <laughs> Tell us a bit, Lila, what was that work in 2016, what you did? Um, no, I mean, since 2016, I haven't been doing work because of, uh, I mean, I've always been kind of cal going through calculated risk um, because I've been refusing to give work to the censorship since 2010. And um, 2011 to 2013, there was the void, which Dalia was mentioning. So there was somehow a, a censorship vacuum. Mm -hmm. which created a margin of freedom as well. Uh, but then since 2013, it has been, uh, um, I mean, some of people in my team had a bit of uh, state security issues um, around 2012, 2013. And then afterwards, it was calculated risk, kind of finding other means to create uh, public, uh, events that are announced in certain ways where tickets, no ticketing happens, like certain um, conditions to kind of evade censorship legally or have a way to answer back in case uh, it, it's attacked. Um, but since 2016, I've been more and more feeling that the uh, arrests were uh, haphazard and the uh, um, attack on, on independent uh, artistic and cultural institutions, along with um, very surreal cases against colleagues, um, theater music, um, and so on. So it, it has been a decision to not create the work that I'd like to create in Egypt since 2016, because I do not want to feel a responsibility for any risk that might happen for people, the people I work with. 
Um, and of course, it's very sad. Uh, we've shown one or two works on one or two nights, uh, almost like in, uh, in secrecy, uh, or like made it very complicated for people to enter who would not be known by another person, let's put it this way. Um, so kind of by invitation only. Um, and it, it, it is quite sad. I don't, um, I know I don't want to create work here unless I feel I have the courage again, the same way I had it, or um, unless things change and I don't think it will happen soon. Or if it's a topic, I'm 100% sure that nobody will be interested in or see see it from any angle that would disturb or bother anyone, which um, I until now haven't thought of that topic, to be mm -hmm. honest. Uh, in 2016, mm -hmm. it was a, the last work that was publicly viewed was a, a work about um, women collectively testifying against the rape by British soldiers, which happened in a village in 1919 in Egypt and sort of looking at these documents, which we found in the Foreign Office archive through the length through our lens as women today. Mm. And um, <clears throat> what you're afraid of would be arrests or um, <clears throat> you would be put out of work? <clears throat> what put would be out the of work is not really the question because none mm. of my work is uh, produced mm. by Egyptian entities. But I mean, uh, laws have been changing uh, in relation to foreign funding. Um, and any kind of support. So also a lot of the funding organizations have either moved offices or officially closed in Egypt. Um, and also, um, I cannot be sure what funding would be seen how, because, you know, the thing is with autocratic states, they always find a way to frame things the way they want. Um, so I don't, think it's only about that but what happened in 2012 to uh, uh, 2013 was that um, we got really bothered by state security every time we entered the Egyptian airport so being investigated searched etc and uh, some people who were working in uh, governmental institutions such as the university uh, would get calls from the security office etc. So things like that direct interaction or intervention by state security who have not been dangerous enough but yet uh, threatening. Mm. Um, and the thing is that rests have been really haphazard in the past I would say three, four years uh, where people have done ridiculous online jokes and have been spending years in prisons and tortured, uh, to say the least, or actually people are imprisoned for no reason at all. Um, usually it's, it's been more about people who've been in the wrong place at the wrong time, could be a passerby or a political activist, but recently it was also really directed at uh, artists, um, which is... I mean, one can take responsibility for oneself, but it kind of feels mm -hmm. uh, not good to take it for other people. Yeah, it's um, incredible um, under what conditions you guys work and what great work you personally also do. And <clears throat> it's a heroic and does show that theater is a place where um, um, thinking happens, where people think and where you do something by thinking and you think by doing and that people can then, then come and see it, even whether it is in small spaces by word to, to word but I can only imagine what that now means then for you guys not even being able to move leave the apartment and what your role is um, 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 Sahar in the how is it in Beirut will there be um, an, a, a, a breath of fresh air will there be an opening after this you think or will the state seize this moment to have more power to crack down like we hear what's happening in Hungary Poland many other states um, African states, will, will, what is your prediction? Will there be a space uh, for doing theater or not? 
I think <clears> always <throat> the answer will be always there will be space. We've been, as uh, you know, we've been battling with censorship for as long as I can remember here in this country, and artists have always been able to find ways to work around censorship or provoke censorship. Um, the last uh, show I saw post-revolution was a show by a company here in Lebanon that I admire and respect, Zukak. And it was um, a documentary process uh, kind of project uh, about love, which is interesting, you know, it kind of mm -hmm. answers your question and resonates with what uh, Dalia also said. And um, I ha we had a talk back with the company. I took my students uh, who are studying a documentary theater class and Zukak ha have always been uh, trying to work with the censor because I think they care to, to show the work. So they weren't trying to provoke or anything. They do the work that they do. But for this particular show, they were, my students were asking whether they submitted the text to the censorship and they said no. And that was a decision post-revolution to not submit the work to the censorship office. They only performed four nights, which was, that, that was their plan. Um, I think the, the authorities here are more afraid of what's happening online more than the theater itself. Um, you know, like also what Leila said, like many uh, uh, people were activists, mainly were arrested for a Facebook status here, you know, mm -hmm. put in jail for several days. Um, people you know and um... pe some people I know some people I'm Facebook friends with some people I know personally but yeah this has been a, an issue recently in Lebanon um, in terms of my experience my la latest experience with the censorship office was uh, when I wanted to perform the the pro documentary project on sex trafficking that was in um, last September and I for the first time I submit the text of the play to the censorship office I used to do it like a kind of closed performance invitation um, a free admission just to not having yeah. to deal I didn't mm -hmm. want to deal with the censorship office before September but now because the plan was to take the play on a national tours, I, I thought I'll just get it over with. And um, I use real names in the play of traffickers, for instance, and people who, and they sent me a letter asking me to change. And I refused simply, I, I asked for a meeting and I met with them and I explained like, uh, you know, uh, it, it's at the essence of documentary theater. I wasn't planning, in, in, you know, a, a, accepting to compromise the integrity of the show or the integrity of the documentary process and uh, and it was kind of a negotiation and they were like okay fine we'll just uh, overlook it um so you know people i think artists will find way uh, in terms of what will surface after uh, post covid 19 i i wish i know i mean i think because i'm personally now uh, in my in, in this period in my career, I'm very much interested in personal testimonies. I think this is what we will need to hear. You know, we need to hear about how people experience this isolation, this connectedness at the same time, because I don't think the world has been more generous than it is now. I mean, mm -hmm. look at all the theaters in the world, the top notch things that we've always wanted to see. Now everything's open for free, you know, the live streaming. You know, I, I feel there's a sense of generosity that's so beautiful, yeah. but at the same mm -hmm. time, there's a sense of fear and sense of uh, trauma and uh, grief. You know, we're all experiencing this. And I think personal testimonies will help us make sense of our humanity and, you know, take it, see what's next, you know, what, what's going to happen next. Um, but, you know, theater has always been a need for me and people in and I people in my at least in my bubble, like people I work with. Mm. We don't do it because, you know, we do it because it's the only thing we, we can do and want to do. It's mm. a survival kind of mechanism. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't want to say an escape, but rather more a need. You know, I, I've always thought it's a right having access to theater should be a right like a you know like education like food like um which is not i mean it might be probably something uh, for granted in other countries but in this country it's not we have mm -hmm. zero support from the government yeah it's incredible i mean we, we used to hear so many complaints from the new york scene and they are real complaints how hard it is to make art how difficult also in the big cities mm -hmm. 
in Europe, where I mean, you're not happen to be one of the biggest theaters, but hearing mm. about your work uh, under the circumstances and the dedication, dedication to work and to the very essence of theater, it is so inspiring. I think the world needs to hear from you. We also, for the global theater community, is important that you are the guys who kind of keep that up. You're the generation who creates work and uh, like many, many generations uh, before. Um, we are coming closer to an end. So let us a little bit know what are you, uh, reading at the moment? Uh, uh, what are you listening to? Do you guys have a journal? So tell us a little bit, maybe Dalia, we start with you. What do you read? What do you listen to? And uh, um, do you keep a diary? Um, I, I do keep a diary and now it's electronic diary and it, it really helps because I can just kind of empty my brain from dreams and <laughs> uh, nightmares or whatever. And uh, I am reading a, a couple of books by Gina Martin and um, I'm, it, they're spiritual books, but they're going back in time to the time when the goddess was the um, more powerful and how things changed in the last 5,000 years. And uh, it's not a spoiler, but I, I'm one of the characters of the book. So it was very funny to read about me 5,000 years ago kind of thing. And Dalia did. And Dalia oh, did. great. So that was um, a, nice, a nice distraction the last, the last few days. And uh, the first book is already published and the second book is under publication. So uh, that was quite interesting. It's called The Sisters of the Solstice Moon by Gina mm -hmm. Martin. So spiritual difference, but really similar because it's kind of Armageddon or end of the world as we know it. And then the major shifts and what happens. So mm. potential possibilities, dire, extreme opportunity. So mm -hmm. That was that was interesting <laughs> yeah sure there is a feeling of an end of time or many artists you know have that feeling anticipated um, um Laila, what do you read and uh, what do you listen to is there something what you might tell our viewers or do you do you write uh, a diary no i don't write a diary at all i've always been really resistant to keeping memories through photos or diaries so i'm really a live moment girl <laughs> Mm -hmm. um, it's very difficult for me to look back on anything, really. Um, I am currently not reading because I've been very busy with distilling the novel into the opera. So mm -hmm. I, when I'm in, as part in a creative process, it's very difficult for me to disengage. Uh, so also at the moment, I'm very much listening to contemporary classical music and opera only. Mm, what opera is the latest one you listen to? Uh, today I was, I listened to Bernstein's um, something cuisine um, song. Um, and the one I keep watching, which is one of my favorites is Katie Mitchell's Alcina. And mm -hmm. I'm generally uh, really a fan of Baroque music. Uh -huh. Fantastic. Thank you. And uh, Sahar? Yeah, I'm uh, just today I read, I'm reading mainly for my classes because this is one thing that I, you know, I, I have to do constantly. So just today I read a play called Hidden by Michael Rod and Laura Eason from an anthology on ethnodrama. Um, and I've been, I haven't been keeping a diary for some time, but uh, just recently, and, and, and because I moved to the village, I found myself recording uh, sounds, as I mentioned. And mm -hmm. um, so I'm, I'm thinking of this as my current diary. I think they will bring up lots of things later on. Yesterday, I recorded the sound of um, the microphone here in this village. It's a very tiny village in Mount Lebanon, really probably like around 2,000 people at max. Um, and when there's an annou announcement to make, they um, broadcast it on some sort of a um, uh, megaphone. What do you call it? Like megaphone, maybe. Mm -hmm. So not, not a van. It's actually, you don't need a van because it's so small. So it's located, they, they have two megaphones located in different locations and they can broadcast the message to all the community. So they were uh, sending out the, mess the new uh, uh, measure by the Ministry of Interior about the recent uh, curfew. Um, so I'm keeping these. I'm listening to baby songs, children's songs with my, mm -hmm. with my kids, baby Einstein <laughs> recently. <laughs> <I was laughs> 
<laughs> so yeah, that's what I'm doing. That's what you're doing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's amazing. Maybe you interview your father and find out some secrets of his life. I, I've been yeah. wanting to do this for so long, Frank, and I've not been able to find the courage. I feel like it's I, I'm asking my husband to do it honestly like he, just yesterday yeah. I asked him to do it for me because I feel it's like I don't want him to interpret this as me say, saying goodbye or something it's, yeah it's but tell him personal. someone from New York asked I, I, you to do it and that you, you <laughs> just had to had to do it as the end of the end, end try. of a, you try um at the end of the question it might be a great monologue coming out but um what would you sell to artists um who are in a similar situation like you, maybe in the Middle East or maybe in other places of the world who live under and work under such difficult circumstances. Is there any kind of advice that you could give them what you all think that they should keep in mind? I, I would tell them what I'm telling myself on a daily basis. Take it easy. Uh, you don't have to, to be productive right now because that has been... You know, that's how I function. My father, uh, this is one thing I take from my father. He started working when he was 12 and he's, he worked until like six months ago. Like he's 85 now. Every day of his life he worked. And this is something I took from him. I'm a hard worker. And for me, it's like, I can't function if I'm not producing, you know, at a very, mm. so, uh, and I, and now being, you know, not, not being able to be productive, I, I keep reminding myself that it's okay. It's time mm -hmm. to experience and to breathe and be present and be grateful and count your blessings and all of this. So take it easy one day at a time and hopefully we'll make it out of this alive. Yeah, that's good advice. Laila? Yeah, really no pressure to be productive. We also don't have to watch everything that's being streamed. Thank you, Laila. Uh, yes, I'm finding quite overwhelming, actually. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm finding I'm really questioning the generosity. I'm really wondering if uh, a lot of places in the world are not worried they will be forgotten, or things are um, individuals are worried they will lose uh, their moment. Um, and I think it's completely fine to be quiet and to attend to just being, to just questioning. I think really to seize the opportunity to question our lifestyles, to question the status quo, to question how we'd like to continue since we don't know what our context will look like. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's, that's very important. You were asking um, if works will be more political. I think especially us as a medium that is collective, that's really based on this collectivity with an audience, there will be a lot of questions raised uh, and we don't really know uh, how we will continue to work or how soon we will be able to work. And if we work, will we continue in the same way? Hmm. No, this is a, these are quite amazing um, questions. Tomorrow, we're coming to the end of our talk now. Tomorrow we hear voices again from Italy. It will be... Uh, Lucia Calamari, a great, great playwright, one of the leading playwrights. She wrote a little poem uh, which is about this time now and questioning Italian theater. It got her into trouble with the theater community. Graziano Graziano will be with us and uh, Graziani will be with us. Valeria Orani from the uh, Playwrights Project. Uh, we will have then artists uh, from Taiwan. Uh, Meredith Monk um, will be with us this week, I think on Thursday, which is going to be also a, a great podcast. So thank you. Uh, really all three of you and you have our highest respect. I cannot tell you how much it means for us to know that you're out there doing that work as a representative you know, of, of, of mankind and keeping on with this old tradition of theater that all of a sudden is also again very, very new. It's encounters um, a new technology and Rancière, the French philosopher always said if an old tradition encounters a completely new technology, something happens that moves things forward. We hope it's in the right direction. There's something to discover. Maybe it will be a hybrid model and we are a bit closer uh, connected. The world has gotten smaller. We are so close. On the other hand, our personal worlds have gotten so small. We are in our apartments. And so we all really have to try to make sense out of it. And we don't have answers or more and more questions, but really uh, thank you for sharing your experience. And uh, again, our respect for all of three of you and all your colleagues out there who do this uh, truly significant work. And we need to hear more of you and your stories. We try at the signal to do that. It's also a call to all theaters 
in the world, uh, in, whether it's in Europe and also in uh, America, to focus and listen what comes uh, from 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 your your place. So thank you all for coming, and please to the audience also thank you. I know how busy everybody is, how much uh, we are doing, and how much is offered online, um, and uh, that you stay with us and listen to 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 these artists is very significant to us. But also for them, it's a great way of showing support and. Uh, Hope to hear you back. So I'm going to say goodbye. Thanks to the great HowlRound, uh, Thea okay. and BJ, um, and Emerson College, who hosted here in Boston, um, and, um, and to May and uh, Sun Young and uh, uh, great Jackie from the Siegel team and everybody who supports us, and of course, to the Graduate Center CUNY. And uh, um, I hope you will join the Siegel Center again. Thank you so much. And uh, thank you, Frank. I hope I see you all see you in New, New York soon. Bye bye. Bye.